Absolutely, pleasure to be here. So I'm I'm Philip Oldfield. I'm head of School of Built Environment at UNSW Sydney. Um, my research falls into kind of two camps really. One is about tall buildings and, and high rise architecture, and in particular, how we can make uh tall buildings more sustainable because I, I think as far as a building type you know the, the tall buildings like the kind of the suv of the architecture world really you know bigger is better more energy intensive and i i'm really interested in how we can how tall buildings can be part of a solution uh, to, to climate change rather than a driver the other thing i'm really interested in is whole life cycle thinking in the built environment um so and in particular around embodied carbon and understanding what uh contribution embodied carbon plays to the whole kind of carbon footprint of a building and then looking at how we can reduce that as well so what strategies uh, technologies and ideas can we use to to bring that part of a building's impact down fantastic and you did write the book uh the sustainable tall building a design primer i bought it as soon as i uh saw it then i reached out to you a little while ago to come on the podcast and it's it's uh we've finally got it which is great um so what what are some of the challenges when we're looking at going the high density high rise construction from an lca point of view and how is it different to say a, a mid-rise building sure so I guess the biggest difference between um, a high-rise building and a mid-rise is, is that z-axis. It's about verticality. It's about, uh, uh, and central to that is exposure. So the tall building tends to be more exposed. And, and what we what we know and what there's robust evidence for is that tall buildings need more materials. Um, and that's typically to resist lateral loads, to resist uh, seismic loads, to resist uh, wind loads. So, um, and because of that, tall buildings need more concrete and more steel, typically per square meter. And as such, they have a higher embodied carbon than mid-rise and low-rise buildings. At the same time, um, tall buildings, again, there's pretty robust evidence here, tend to have a higher operational emissions. Now, now why is that? Well, second you rise above the kind of urban realm you're more exposed so in colder climates you're more exposed to the wind uh, which might uh, you know reduce uh, or encourage sorry um, heat loss in colder climates in hotter climates you're more exposed to unwanted solar gain so this is a big challenge with tall buildings when you look at the embodied carbon part of the equation they're they're worse than medium rise and low rise. And when you look at the operational part of the equation, they're worse. And so that really what I'm interested in is, does it have to be that way? And I don't think it does, but there's another component there as well. We've got to look at the sustainability of our building types beyond the, the boundary of the object, the boundary of the building. And what tall buildings can do is contribute to more sustainable ways of life. Um, I, I think of the city of London, for example, the, the eastern cluster of buildings. You know, you've got some buildings in there which probably don't have a great sustainability reputation. Buildings like the, the walkie-talkie, or as it's commonly known, the walkie-scorchy, because it had a big south-facing curved glazed facade that, that caused uh, reflection problems. But across those 12 buildings, you've got something like a um, million square feet or even more of... of of, of office space you've got I think I calculated tens of thousands of people work there you've got something like 150 200 car parking spaces the vast majority every one of those buildings every one of those buildings is within five minutes of uh, mass rapid transit um, and so by creating that level of what really is hyper density you can foster uh, efficiencies that I don't think is possible with low and mid-rise uh, buildings. Yeah, fantastic. And one of the ways we can measure to compare is the uh, an LCA, a life cycle analysis, which used mm -hmm. to be an acronym. I'd say, you know, not many people knew, but today everyone is somewhat aware. So how can this be used in an intelligent way to make sure we're making good decisions um, across the board and, you know, particularly around upfront carbon slash embodied carbon? Mm -hmm. Well, look, I think, you know, it's, um, 
it's wild that we're in 2021 and I can only think of one jurisdiction that has minimum embodied carbon requirements, and that's the Netherlands, I think. Other countries, Denmark, France, um, the Scandinavians, certain um, American states are, and are looking at putting these things in. But that's a whole component of LCA, a whole part of a building's life cycle that's just ignored. And if you think of the entire history of of, of buildings and environment, or certainly from a 20th century perspective, um, it's been focused on operations. Interestingly, if you go back beyond the 20th century, you know, it has, it did look at materials and researchers like Barnabas Calder have really started to emphasize that. But really, our, our regulatory framework has been focused on energy efficiency. And we've got a lot better. We've got a lot better at that. But really, we need to expand that regulatory framework to consider buildings across this whole life cycle, including upfront and then body carbon, but also end of life as well. You know, what are the, the carbon emissions at the end of a building's life? That can be very difficult to determine because there's huge uncertainties. I mean, we know we recycle something like, you know, between 90 and 100 percent of metals now when a building's demolished. But, you know, what what is the market going to be for different materials in uh, 50 years, 100 years? We don't know, but we've got to be building in those components so we have a holistic understanding of um, the impact our buildings have on the environment. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I don't know about you, Phil, but I, a few, you know, when I hear zero carbon or getting to zero carbon, a lot of the time um, it's not even in the asterisk saying, oh, we're only talking about operational energy. We're not really talking about embodied carbon. So it's a, yeah. a definition thing as well. If you are, you know, do you think, do you see that definition changing and, and the focus looking at beginning to have embodied carbon as part of the the net zero discussion? I think it has to. I think it has to. Um, what we're finding now in in some places is decarbonisation of uh, domestic electricity, say in the UK, has has rapidly fallen as as the UK have embraced offshore uh, wind um, and, and other renewable resources. And what that means is typically in the UK now, um, one kilowatt hour of electricity is something like 0.23 kilograms of, of CO2. That's really low. And it means to operate a building, you know, it can be relatively efficient. That's not to say that we don't need to really, you know, improve our energy efficiency. But it means that in a lot of places across their kind of, um, across their life cycle, and body carbon is starting to become the biggest component, I think. You know, if you go back, 20 years, we all thought body carbon was 10, 20%. You go back five years, well, maybe 40%. Now we're seeing 50, 60% of a building's carbon footprint over 50 years. And certainly if you build a building today, 2021, um, over the next 29 years, you know, to 2050, which is seen as a general target for, for net zero, and body carbon is going to be the biggest player there. And so I, I think we really do have to look at this idea of definition. What is net zero energy? What is net zero carbon? And I think, again, you know, we can see certain places have embraced this. So in, in Norway, there's six different definitions of what net zero means. And they range from net zero operations, just including heating, cooling, ventilation. Net zero operations, including small power loads. Okay, that takes it a bit bigger. Then just including uh, operations, small power loads, and upfront. Then including operations, small power loads, upfront, and end of life until you've got, you know, the full life cycle, net zero as well. And that's really our our ultimate aim is to get down to zero across the life cycle of a building. Mm. You mentioned how we've uh, made some strides when it comes to operational energy and driving down the prices there. Uh, where are we now and what sort of solutions do we have on offer for um, particularly around embodied carbon and, and materials to, to reduce our impacts for our taller buildings? So um, I really like the... Um the World Green Building Council's report uh, bringing embodied carbon up front. I think it's a great report that really encapsulates where we stand. And they suggest there's four ways of reducing embodied carbon. And the first uh, 
two are probably the most controversial, but for me, show a huge amount of potential. And that's build nothing and build less. And it's fundamentally, as a society, we should be asking the question, when do we build? You know, um, you know, there's, there's, there's few things we can do that are more transformational to a community than building. We can build uh, social housing. We can improve energy poverty. Um, we can build hospitals and great places to work. Um, but we have to question, do we need brand new vertical casinos, for example? Do we need, you know, and these and this is a tough question. And I'm, I'm a head of school and built environment. So it's in my interest and in my students' interest that we build. But we do need to question when a lot more. The second one of those is build less. And that's about, you know, refurbishing what we've got before we um, before we build new, which, again, I think is a is a just one of the most obvious things we should do. We shouldn't be knocking down um Good buildings, and in the UK, I think they knock down something like fifty thousand buildings a year. And the Architects Journal, um, their campaign "Retrofit First," I think, is shows a way for for what we kind of should be doing. But we do need to build. You know, I think something like one point six billion people around the world have inadequate shelter, and that says to me we have a societal and a a kind of moral obligation to build. So when we do build, um, we've got to be looking at how we reduce embodied carbon. Um, so, and if you are building and you can't retrofit and you can't not build, you know, so I think there's a number of different ways there. There's first um, dematerialization, so using less materials. Um, in tall buildings, dematerialization strategies are, are well established. So alternative structures such as, say, diagrid, you're moving the structure to the outside of the building and integrating the the lateral and um, and vertical loads together can, can reduce materials. But I also think there's this huge move, a very positive move towards uh, biomaterials and towards things like timber towers, which I'm, I think are, show a huge amount of promise, given that, as I said before, we've established that tall buildings have a, have a huge embodied carbon. And that's a real problem. So by introducing a sustainable material or a material that um, sequests carbon during its growth, and even if you if even if you don't include the sequestration, uh, timber is lower in body carbon than, than than steel and concrete. And so using CLT, using glue lamp to create vertical buildings, you know, I think there's robust evidence that creates um, a lower embodied carbon. So for me, that's one of the obvious mechanisms we should be looking at for vertical buildings. Yeah, that sounds sounds good. And what are some of the, the important aspects we need to get right? If we are choosing timber, what are some of the nuances around that to make sure it's flowing through so it's still a sustainable design? Mm. So from there's, there's an interest there in, in terms of how we measure life cycle analysis and if you and a lot of people think embodied carbon is a static thing you know it's the upfront carbon i don't call it upfront carbon i call it embodied carbon because from my perspective um it's dynamic it changes it changes so if you look at a concrete building when we create concrete we heat up limestone in a kiln to create clinker and fossil fuels power that kiln so you've got some a carbon footprint there but also when you heat up the, the limestone, it, chemi- it breaks down chemically and releases CO2. So there's a, d- a definitive chemical release of concrete. Mm-hmm. So if you look at the profile of concrete over time, you've got this big upfront um, emission. And what that says to me is we should be using less concrete. We should be dematerializing concrete. Now, timber, you've got the exact opposite almost. So through photosynthesis, trees absorb uh, carbon from the air. Uh, and so actually, as trees grow, you know, you start off with a kind of negative carbon footprint in, in, in some ways, a kind of negative carbon emission. And, and that benefit can be applied to the building. And I think we've got to be very careful about that. I think that I think it's a legitimate benefit. But that suggests the more timber we add to a building, the better it performs. Now, I've got a problem with that because I think fundamental resource efficiency means we should be very, very careful with what building, with what materials we use. I'm not suggesting anyone's going to be over um, structurally adding material to a building to get a better result, but theoretically you could. So one of the key things from timber from my perspective is ensuring that 
if you are including a sequestration at the beginning of the building's life, you're also measuring through to the, the emissions at the end of a building's life. And what our research has, has shown is that that is, um, it's those upfront emissions that are really important for concrete and it's those end of life emissions which are really important for timber. So, so how can we make, how can we foster that into our design thinking? And, and for me, it's about, with our timber buildings, we are talking about long-term carbon storage. And you want to make that as long term as possible. So if if you're if that building's only lasting twenty years, that's a big problem. If that building's lasting fifty years, okay, but if it's lasting a hundred years, you are locking that carbon emission up in that building for as long as possible. And then we should be looking at well, what happens to that timber component at the end of fifty years or hundred years? Can we can we re, uh, reuse it? Can we uh, recycle it rather than sending it to landfill or burning it for bioenergy? You know, can we lock in that emission for as long as possible? Now that's very different to concrete. And then concrete, I think it's just about reducing the amount of cement we use as much as possible. For timber, it's all about okay, we've got to think fifty or hundred years forward here. Um, and try and plan for those timber components staying in the building life cycle or staying in the built environment as long as possible. Absolutely. Well, there's so much. There's so much in that. Um, you know, durability, design for disassembly, all those things. They they tie back in. And again, it's a multi collaborative, you know, multidisciplinary, um, you know, solution for project by project to getting those things right. So it's um, sustainable. Because you're right. If we it's somewhat, it can be conditionally sustainable if, if we're, you know, using a, the sequestered carbon only for 10 or 20 years or something and then burning it straight after for, for whatever reason, then obviously that's, uh, that's no good compared to what it could be. And uh, Absolutely. It's yeah. all about, um, you know, thinking about each material and each strategy across it's about life cycle thinking for me it's about life cycle thinking and acknowledging you know we we still consider buildings up to day one pass the key over you know theoretically uh, the client moves in and you know our, our job's over in some ways it's not you know we've got to think about you know the life beyond the building that's so well it's been such a pleasure pleasure to be able to speak to you today phil uh what where can people find you and what sort of research are you currently looking at um, you know, if they if they want to learn learn more about what you what you're currently working on. Sure. Uh, yes. Yeah. So as I say, I'm at, at UNSW. I mean, the the latest project we've just kind of finished um, looks at it's a it's a top down project. It looks at the Australian built environment, and what we did is we measured um, the embodied and operational carbon of every building in Australia using a stock and flow model between um, 1990 and 2050. So we measured the past 30 years and we measured the, the, the kind of next 30 years and we looked at different scenarios. So effectively, we're asking from a top-down perspective, how do we get down to net zero in Australia, the entire built environment? And, and you know, and what we, what we found is, look, um, we got pretty close to net zero using um, building a bit less um, building far more efficiently, investing an extra 100% in energy efficiency, electrifying everything, you know, shifting away from fossil fuels, having a rapid change in, in terms of our shift to renewable energy. And interestingly, for this podcast as well, we built in 30% um, of new buildings being timber. So we increased it uh, quite slowly, 1%, 1 year, 2%, 3%, 4%. And what we found is the, the carbon benefit of that timber, the sequestration, actually pushed the embodied carbon of the building stock into, into the negative figures. Now, obviously, later, beyond 2050, some of that will be released as well, but that was a big contributor to us getting down to, we, were, we weren't quite net zero in 2050, um, but the scenario we used got us really close, 94% lower than, than a business as usual kind of model. So that's one of the things I'm interested in, is how do we get the built environment down to zero uh, by 2050. What are the pathways? What are the mechanisms? What are the policies we should be enacting? That's so good. And uh, of course, anyone listening right now, I highly recommend go out and buy the Sustainable Tall Building. It's a it's a wonderful book. I accidentally left it at my old uh, office I used to work at. For, um, and uh, yeah, I 
since COVID, I haven't been able to grab it. I usually got it in the background for, for interviews. But anyway, any, anyone else can go out and buy it. Thank you so much, Phil. That was an absolute pleasure to be able to chat with you today.